if you would, turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Um, as I was thinking about, you know, we're not um, in Advent uh, anymore, obviously, and we're not back in the book of Acts yet. And so we got a chance here for a standalone sermon, and I thought, hey, what better to talk about <clears throat> on the new year than the new covenant? What better to talk about on the new year than the new birth, than what happens to a person when they turn to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and experience salvation? Because here's the deal. As much y'all in here, you're gonna make some resolutions and you're going ahead, you're gonna break them next Wednesday, okay? So we're just gonna go ahead and we're gonna talk about something that can actually bring legitimate change. And that's exactly what the new covenant is that we have in Jesus Christ. And so... <clears throat> As I think about the Bible Belt, you know, I think, I make an assertion right here that I think one of the greatest problems is that there is, not one, generally speaking, a low view of the supernatural, a low view of what God is capable, capable of and that he works in our lives. And even more specifically than that, that there is a low view of what we call biblically regeneration, a low view of what it means to experience the new birth, to experience salvation and how that changes someone. And so <clears throat> consequentially, what happens is we have a low view of the new birth. What happens is there becomes an allowance to a greater and greater degree for apathy, an allowance for sin, an allowance for disobedience, an allowance for a lackluster commitment to Christ. And as that allowance increases, what happens is that allowance turns into an expectation. And so that the expectation is that there's not only allowance for those kind of things, but there's an expectation that develops that when someone professes Christ, we expect them to behave that way. And so what happens, I think, ultimately, in a lot of, in a lot of Christian cultures in the Bible Belt is what you have is a lot of caged wolves, a bunch of caged wolves. And, and what do I mean? Well, let's say that you have a super huge, I don't know, wolf hanging out around your property. I don't know why there's a wolf around here hanging around your property, but let's say there is. You have this wolf, and it poses a threat to you, maybe your life. It poses a threat to your children's lives. And this wolf maybe even poses a threat to your animals. It's just, I mean, it is salivating to eat something, to kill. And so what do you do? Maybe you get it locked up in a cage. And so, yeah, the problem solved. You know what? The wolf is not going to attack you. The wolf's not going to attack your children. But if you focus on the wolf, here's the thing. You can put him in a cage, but nothing changes about him. He's still salivating for the same old things. He's still after the same old things. And if he could stick his neck far enough out of that cage, he would eat. And I would say this is what happens so often. And this is what religion alone is like. Religion's like a cage, and for many, there's just this constraint, this cage of religion that they put on that constrains their evil, but it doesn't really change the nature of who they are. And what I tell you this morning, to experience the new birth is not that. It's something far more radical that happens. Well, you're not a caged wolf. You're a wolf that has been turned into a sheep. Your entire nature has changed. And so if you would stand with me as we read this morning in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Starting in verse seven, we're gonna see what Paul says about the greatness of this new covenant. Starting in verse seven. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I just pray this morning that through this text, as we see the glory of what you have done through Jesus and the change that you bring, God, that you would not let us leave until we have met you 
in your power of what you have done to understand that you bring change. You have not come to bring us a religion, Lord, simply alone. You have come to bring your Holy Spirit and salvation and forgiveness and a new creation to those who would walk in you, Lord. And I pray that that is what we would see and that we would worship. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So I'm just telling you what, it starts out, now if the ministry of death, okay, now when I got this job here as pastor at East Campus two months ago, I'm telling you a thing that I didn't say I wanted to bring around this place. I didn't say, hey, you know, oh, you know what, I wanted high view, I just want a ministry of death. Like, I just want the ministry of condemnation. Like, what is Paul talking about right here? The ministry of death that he is talking about is the old covenant. What is the old covenant? Well, the old covenant, if we look back in the book of Exodus and we see the giving of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, it is the agreement between God and the people of Israel, this covenant that's set before them. If the people of Israel are obedient, God will bless them. If they are disobedient, they are going to be cursed and even exiled. And that's what we see in the nation of Israel's history, ultimately because of their disobedience. The northern kingdom is exiled in 722 BC, and then beginning in 605, the southern kingdom begins to be exiled. So why is it called the ministry of death? Is it the law's fault that we die? No, look at Romans 7, 5. We should have this one. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So what's he saying? Why is it called the ministry of death? Because what the law pulls out of us is our sinfulness. It's kind of like, don't touch that wet paint right there, so what do you do? You touch the paint. Like that's, It brings it out of us. Do not commit adultery. What happens? Evoked out of the sinful passions of man are all kinds of lusts. It is not the law that brings us death. It is our sin that brings death. It is the law that sets on us our condemnation for it. And then again in chapter 7, verse 13, he says this. Did that which is good, meaning the law, bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. You know what the law does? The more you try to obey the law, the more sinful you realize that you are. That's the point of the law. It's one giving as a blessing because they know how to obey God, but the law is given as the school teacher, as Paul says, to show you, you cannot fulfill righteousness. But a lot of times I don't think we feel the weight of the law in our culture. And in June, when I was in Israel, I'll tell you what, if you're in Jerusalem for five minutes, you can see the weight of the law on these people. I mean, they will not push an elevator button on the Sabbath because they think it's work, Okay. And you understand why Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light because the, the, what they're trying to do with the Torah, with obedience to the Old Testament, is absolutely unbelievable. And I was talking to the guy who was given to be our, kind of our bodyguard for the two weeks or so he was there. His name was Shlomo, which means Solomon. And I was talking to him, talking about God, talking about uh, this Messiah, the reason we're there in Jerusalem, this man named Jesus. And, I, and he gave up Orthodox Judaism, trying to follow all these rules. And, he, and I said, why? And he said, because that's exhausting. He said, I can't stand that. And I said, oh, man, I'm, I'm with you. I couldn't do that either. And I said, which leads me to a really good point about somebody uh, who did that. And, and so we're talking about this. And I said, <clears throat> so what do you do? He says, I do my best. And I said, do you think that's enough? And he said, yeah, I think so. I think God just sees my actions. I, I hope he sees that's enough. And I said, well, do you care if I share what Jesus said? He's like, yeah, sure. And so I began to share the Sermon on the Mount with him. In the Sermon on the Mount, what does Jesus do? Jesus takes the external commandments of the law and he shows that they're way deeper than that. He shows they're about the heart. And when I got to the point about adultery, I said, you know, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, I've said that verse to a lot of people in my life, and I've never seen the reaction this guy had, but his jaw hit the floor. Why? He was realizing the weight of the law. This guy has never read, the Old the, never read the New Testament, never read the writings of Paul, never read about what it means to be enslaved in sin, and you know what he did? 
he, he's not, his English wasn't good, and he stuck his hands up around his neck, and he started shaking his head, and he put his hands together like this, and he said, it's like I'm in chains. And this is exactly what the law does is it shows our sinfulness. It shows our condemnation. It shows that there is no possible way we're getting out of this on our own. And this is the problem. This is why so many presentations of the gospel fall flat. It's because we try to get to the good news way too fast, and by when we get there, it's not good news because there's no bad news to deal with. There has to be this recognition why Paul in the first three chapters of Romans goes sin, 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 sin. Romans chapter three, none is righteous, no, not one. All have turned aside, all have become worthless. The throat is an open grave, the venom of asps is under their tongues and he goes on and on and on. That we're like an open grave, we're like a corpse rotting in the ground before God. Charles Spurgeon said this, If your religion does not make you holy, it will condemn you. It is simply painted pageantry to go to hell in. We do not want to be like in a cage. We do not want to be under the law. All religion does is cage us. We need freedom. And a beautiful thing in Ezekiel chapter 36, about 600 years before the birth of Christ, Ezekiel prophesied this. He said, God says this, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. What is God's solution? He's got to completely change us. He has to completely change our hearts. So what does this look like? How is he going to do this? What are the results of this? That's what we're going to look at today in this text. And I want to really look at three evidences of the new covenant, how this happens, what it entails. Let's read verses 7 and 8 again. If the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory, the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face Verse eight, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? So what is Paul referencing right here? He's referencing Exodus chapter 34. When Moses went up to Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, the presence of God was so ridiculous upon him that his face was shining. Okay, now here's one of those parts where you gotta ask, do I believe the scriptures or not? His face is shining. And Paul says, you think that's a big deal. You know what the new covenant is? That very God is going to live within you. The presence of that God is going to be perpetual within you. It's not going to leave. The glory is not going to fade. And he continues to compare these all the way through verse 11. The lesser to the greater. The ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness. That which was being brought to an end, that which is permanent. And thinking through these things, the first evidence of the new covenant, I think, in this text is glory. The first evidence of what it does, it brings glory. Glory to God and worship and glory manifested from the life life of someone who has been changed by this. In John chapter 3, Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus, a Pharisee. And Jesus tells him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is like, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And here's what happens. I think so often, Nicodemus gets a really bad rep in this text, okay? And people, what are you you thinking, Nicodemus? Why are you asking that stupid question? But the thing is, if Jesus was talking about being born again to you and me and talking about the wind blowing where it wills, nobody knows, like we'd be saying the same thing. What are you talking about? But Jesus, he's referencing back to Ezekiel 36, talking about this new birth, this need for a new birth. And Nicodemus, I'll tell you what, you're right. He doesn't understand what Jesus is talking about. That's true. He doesn't understand, though he should. But I'll tell you what Nicodemus does understand. Nicodemus understands that whatever Jesus is talking about right here is more radical than anything he's ever heard. He understands that whatever change that needs to take place in the heart of someone cannot be engineered by man. 
that this is something God's got to do. And so he goes on in verse 8, and Jesus says this, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So Jesus says, hey, you can't see wind, but you know what you can do? You can hear it. You can hear it. You can see its effects. So it's the same with those who are born of the Spirit. So you imagine, you look out your house and you see this tree. It's standing still. The leaves aren't moving. Nothing's being rustled within it. What can you assume? There's no wind. But if you look out your house and you see this tree and it's being bent over and the leaves are flying off of it and the branches are flying off of it and that trunk is being bent, what you can say is, man, there are some gale force winds outside. And Jesus says the same thing. If we have been touched by the Spirit, you can't see it, you can't explain it, you don't know where it comes from, but what you are doing, you know, is your life like a tree is being bent under the hurricane of God's power. And this is the glory that the new covenant brings. It brings such a change that it is evident that the Spirit has worked. Jonathan Edwards wrote this. He said, true salvation always produces an abiding change of nature in a true convert. Therefore, whenever holiness of life does not accompany a confession of conversion, it must be understood that this individual is not a Christian. Let's make it clear. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That this is radical. This is work of God. And my fear is that so many are trying to live a new covenant life without a new covenant birth with what needs to occur is being talked out in this passage, and it's impossible. John the Baptist said in chapter three, verse 27 of John, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. And I'll tell you what, that's a little uncomfortable, that we have no control. We have nothing to bring except one thing, and it's our sin. That's all we've got to bring. That this new birth has to happen. And before we discuss, hey, what does this look like? What, well, how can I experience the, this God and turn to this Lord who I need so desperately? The first thing we got to do is examine in light of the glory the new covenant brings. We have to ask, does my life demonstrate someone who has been touched the, by the power of this God? Does my life demonstrate this? And if it does, if I do know him, man, the power that we have access to through the presence of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you what, when you begin to devote yourself to holiness, to a lifestyle rooted in the new covenant of being a new creation where you are seeking God and beholding his presence and you begin to see your prayers answered and you begin to see God work in your life amidst suffering, you cannot turn away because of God's greatness and his glory. Secondly, in this text, let's read chapter 12, or chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. I was in Ireland in July this summer, and we were in a car, and we had one day to go sightsee. And we were on the southwest coast of Ireland uh, on this thing called the Ring of Kerry in Killarney National Park. And we had one day, okay, to go see the beauty of this, of this Ring of Kerry that everybody's been talking about. Oh, my goodness, it's so great. It's so awesome. You've got to experience it. You've got to see it. It's going to blow your mind. And so we're tracking up the side of this mountain, and it is the densest fog I've ever seen in my life. Like, I'm like, are you serious, man? Like, we're out here driving up this mountain, and you cannot see anything on either side of the road. And the more we sit there, and I'm like, you know, tell, I'm getting frustrated in my mind. I'm like, this is, it's probably not that great anyway, like, you know. And like, I'm slowly thinking, you know, it's, we're not really probably missing that much. Maybe it's not that much to experience, you know, whatever. And so we're going on. And all of a sudden, we come out from under this tunnel. And it was like, <laughs> the heavens had opened, Okay. 
we went from zero to 100% visibility in about a second. And the fog, there was a break in it. And not only was there a break in the fog, that the sun was shining down in the valley. And you could see for miles and miles and miles. And the lush green Ireland la landscape was going up into this jagged mountain on the top. And there were rocks all across it. There was a basin of water at the bottom. There, was these, there were these sheep all over, you know, fro frolicking around all over the hillside. I mean, it's like a Hallmark card out here. And man, you could see there are these houses at the bottom of the mountain and some, the guy next to me, his name is Matt, he said, man, there's a great sermon illustration in here somewhere. And so here it is. See, <laughs> this is what happens. <laughs> this is what happens to experience the new birth. It's like you have not been able to see anything You've been wondering, everybody's talking about how great this God is. Everybody's talking about how great the power of Jesus is, but I've not seen it. But when you see it, when you have turned to the Lord, as Paul says right here, the veil is removed. The veil is removed. And what are you able to see? You are able to behold the glory of God. And I'm going to tell you what, when you do, you ain't got to be told to keep looking. Because of the power that you must behold in Jesus Christ. Paul says the veil lies over the Jew's heart. In the same way there's a veil over our heart. We're dead in our sin. We're blind in the trespasses that we've committed. But this is the beauty of the gospel. Yeah, we have no control over the new birth. But guess what? We've been given a command. This is how. How do we know this God? How can we possibly know him? Well, Paul says, turn to the Lord. Through Christ it is taken away. You know, Jesus said in John 3, after talking about, you know, we don't know how the new birth works. We can't understand it. After that, you know what he says? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. How can we experience salvation? We have to turn to Christ. Because why? Because that weight of the law that Shlomo felt that day, that you and I must feel in our sin. It's like a 10 billion, 10 billion pound millstone up over your back and you cannot move it because we cannot obey the law. There is no chance, but you know what Jesus did? He put that law and the righteousness of the law and he put that millstone on his back and he carried it up to Calvary and on him was placed our disobedience in our sin. And Christ fulfills the law that we cannot. He dies the death that we deserve. And he is raised up from the dead so that the power of his resurrection might transform us to have a new heart. Now that is what we need. That is what we need. And I urge you today, God commands everyone everywhere to repent, to turn and believe the gospel. To turn to Jesus Christ for salvation because there is no other name given under heaven among by which whom men must be saved but by the name of Jesus Christ. There is no other way to have the veil removed. So why is it when we turn to Jesus that we see so clearly in 2 Corinthians 4, if you probably turn a page over in your Bible, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, it says this, God who said, light, let light shine out of darkness. Hear this, the God who created the universe, the power of creation, God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Why, when you turn to Jesus, are you, is the veil removed? Why, when we turn to Jesus, can we see clearly? It's because he is the radiance of the glory of God. He is God manifest in the flesh. And to experience him is to experience God's fullness. And so what we can do today, I'll tell you, well, we must throw ourselves on the mercies of God and turn to Christ. Even as a believer, Paul is consistently praying for the Ephesian church, for the Philippian church, for the church at Colossae to be further able to see the glory of God, even when they're saved. Even when we are saved, we need the help of the Holy Spirit to experience him. And what's this last mark? So we've seen it brings glory. How does it happen? It happens through the new birth that's had through one turning to the salvation that is in the name of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. And what does it produce? It produces growth. Verse 17 and 18. Now the Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You hear this? 
It's not about being a caged wolf because it says the exact opposite. We need to be freed, but not freed in our old nature. We need to be freed from our sin nature. We need to be freed, what freed to what? Freed to righteousness. Why? Because God changed our heart. We are now a slave to righteousness. And we're no longer doing what we hate and not doing what we don't, what we do want to do. I don't see how confusing that is. I just got my own self confused. We are doing what we want in obedience to Christ. Why? Because God has changed us. Nobody has to, had to convince us to look at that hillside, hillside in Ireland and view the majesty of God's creation. Why? It's because it was incredible. And in the same way, no one has to convince us if we've been born of the Spirit to behold the Lord. And this is what Paul says you do when you've experienced this salvation. He says, we all with unveiled face, so now we can see clearly because of who Christ is, because of his power, Beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Beholding the glory of the Lord with unveiled face. Do we know the God that this is talking about? This is the God in the book of Hebrews is described as a blazing, all-consuming fire. A darkness, a gloom, and a tempest. In Psalm 97, who says, the mountains melt like wax before the Lord of all the earth. The God of 2 Kings 19, who slew, slew 185,000 Assyrians in one swoop, who opposed him and the people of God. This is the God whose word is living and active, according to Hebrews 4. Sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit and of joint and of marrow. And no creature is hid from his sight. This is the God we have the chance to behold. This is the glory we have the chance to behold. And what happens when we behold the glory of God? We are transformed. Because just as salvation is not engineered by us, neither is transformation engineered by us either. You know, that's one thing. A lot of people say, you know, do this, obey this, obey that, and you'll be a spiritual person. That's false. The only way to be a spiritual person is to have the Holy Spirit and to be transformed likewise by him. To be transformed. So how can we behold the glory of the Lord? How do we do this? I'll tell you what. There are no secrets to this. There are no secrets to beholding the glory of the Lord. I think it's too often we're looking for this quick fix, this immediate satisfaction. In a convenience culture, that's how we operate. When beholding the glory of the Lord, how do we do this? Well, number one, we meditate on what he's done for us. We're in the scriptures. If you think you can behold the glory of the Lord without being disciplined in the scriptures, man, you're deceived. This is his revealed word that is living and active. How do we behold him? Through being in the scriptures every single day. Through being in prayer to our heavenly father. Who has said, ask, and Jesus said, ask anything in my name and it will be done for you. To be in prayer, to be in scripture, to memorize an amount of scripture that people think you're weird. To spend time with the Lord that people are thinking like, man, what's your deal? I'll tell you what's my deal. I've been transformed by the glory of God. And he's the Lord of creation. I just want to know him. But again, we so often, we're immediate satisfaction, immediate results. I mean, golly, two nights ago, my precious wife was out there in the Kroger parking lot about 7 p.m., sitting in that click list parking spot. You know what I'm saying? She just hung out because, you know, it'd be way too hard for her to just go reach for those vanilla wafers on the, on the, in the aisle. You know, she might pull a bicep or something. So what we do, we get the Kroger quick list to bring us out some food. Why? Because I'm not going in to shop for my groceries. you like, you see something you wanted for Christmas or something for somebody on Amazon. What do you do? You go down and you're like, no, uh I'm not doing the five to seven day shipping. We ain't none of that business. Somebody get me Amazon Prime up here. I'm trying to get that two day stuff. You know, I want it right now. And that's how we operate on so many levels. And so then when we come to the word of God, then we come to the Lord in prayer. Then when we come to someone to share the gospel with him, we're dumbfounded when we don't see immediate results. When almost always in the scripture, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God like farming. And he talks about it like the growth of a tree which is long. 
that this is gonna take some serious time and discipline to behold the glory of the Lord. I had someone tell me this week, and I, I'll tell you what, everybody in here has experienced this. I'm experiencing it. I'm preaching to myself right now, okay? I need to hear this, what I'm about to say. Somebody said to me this week, and I've said it, I've thought it, we've all thought it. I prayed to the Lord, and I just didn't feel anything. I didn't see anything. I read the scriptures, and I didn't feel anything. And just so happened I knew this person had really been in the scriptures a whole lot. And I'm thinking, man, listen, when you go and you've been in a dark room and your eyes and your pupils are not adjusted and then you try to walk into the presence of God, you're not ready yet again to behold his presence. It takes some adjusting. And furthermore, I said this, and some of you may think this is harsh. I don't think it's harsh. I think we need to be more honest with one another. That we have to stop viewing the spiritual disciplines, spending time in scripture, spending time in prayer, we have to stop viewing them like a transaction and start viewing them more as a time just to spend with our God. Because as long as we're spending time with God in view of a transaction, I'm telling you, you're gonna come away disappointed. Because this is not a scratch your back, you scratch mine, Lord. This is just an opportunity to know him. And over time, as we're in the scriptures, as we're, as we're faithful, we will more and more know the glory and the experience and the answered prayers of the Lord. But man, David said in Psalm 66, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have heard my prayer. So there are some, it says in Jesus' life, he was heard because of his reverence, that there has to be a commitment to the Lord in beholding him. But praise the Lord for his grace even in our failure and, the, and here's what I would say to you today. There is no limit to the degree with which you can experience the power, the glory, the spirit of God. There is no limit if this is true. I'm telling you what it is because Jesus is seated up at the right hand of God and he is surely going to accomplish it. There is no limit to what you can experience. And so the question is, and I've asked this before, how far are you willing to go to know your God? How far will you walk down a road of holiness to experience Jesus, to know and follow him and to experience who he is? Because we've got a million excuses I've had a million in my life, all right? And I'll tell you what, all the excuses, I, somebody needs to tell me every time I make an excuse, no, Blake, here's your problem. You don't wanna worship God. That's your problem. And man, it so much is. And I'm not talking about things that happen that we can't help. I'm talking about the, the, the daily kind of the things that we tell ourselves that we don't have to seek the Lord, that we don't need him, that we don't need his presence, and I'm not saying this morning, transformed by the new covenant, are we gonna be perfect? Absolutely not. Just come hang out with me to, for a day. <laughs> you know, and I'm gonna blow it at some point. But that's what the grace of God has bought for us, is forgiveness. And I wanna tell you this morning, as you enter into 2018, I pray to do two things. Number one, have I been transformed by the God of this Bible? Or have I been caged like a wolf? And has my evil just been constrained, but my desires have never changed? And I say today that you need to turn to the Lord and what Jesus has done. And if you have in 2018, I pray, it is my prayer for Highview Baptist Church that we would be a people committed to the word of God in our lives, disciplined, committed to prayer. And I'm not talking about five minutes. I'm talking about seeking after the Lord with all of our hearts, because if he has risen, he is worth it. He is worth that level of commitment. In 2018, make that be your goal. It's just to know the Lord, to behold his glory in order that you might be transformed. And our musicians, are, as they're making their way up here this morning. Listen, maybe that it helps you just to have a time of, hey, a physical response. Maybe if you wanna just come up here, hey, this stage is open. If you wanna just pray, you wanna bring your family, you say, hey, what are we gonna be about in 2018? How are we gonna set the trajectory of, our, trajectory of our lives that we might behold the glory of God? 
that he has paid for our sin, maybe you just need to, hey, do some soul searching right now. And I pray whatever it is that you need to do, that you would respond in some way in your heart. Because I'm telling you, there is nothing like experiencing the satisfaction and the joy that is in knowing Jesus. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, thank you so much, God, for this text. Lord, I just pray, Lord, you would forgive me of my own sin. Lord, of my own problems, my own struggles, my own excuses that I have, Lord, because I know what you said. You said, take up your cross, Lord, and I pray you would help us do that, God. If not by your spirit, we cannot. Lord, thank you for purchasing us, purchasing us with your blood. Lord, and I pray that here at High View, God, that every single individual in here would be about knowing and following you. And I pray this in Jesus' name.